All right. Well, <laughs> so glad to all finally be here. And I apologize for my TARDIS background too. I meant to take that off, but there we are. So right, uh, we're all time lords today. Uh, but my name is Liza Long. I'm an assistant professor at the College of Western Idaho, and I'm here with my co-presenters and co-creators, Joel Glad and Amy Minervi, to talk to you about modular OERs and designing open textbooks for flexibility and adaptability. And I'll let uh, Joel go ahead and introduce himself really quickly, and then Amy. I'm Joel, and I also teach at CWI in the English department. I teach writing and rhetoric, and I teach American literature as well. And I'm Amy Minervini, and I'm an instructor of English at Lewis Clark State College in Lewiston, Idaho. Great. Well, thank you both for being here and thank you for everyone who's attending today. We really appreciate the opportunity from Idaho State University and Kristen uh, to have a chance to share our pandemic project and labor of love with all of you. So uh, Amy, Joel and I were all OPAL fellows with the Idaho State Board of Education and we had the opportunity to really go from zero to textbook over the past year or so. Um, but before we get started, we would really, we'll talk to you really briefly, would love if you could, uh, click, are you able to can we put this in chat, Joel, this link really quick? Are you able to put that in chat? All right, I can grab it. We'd love if you'd take a quick survey. We'd just like to know from our audience today, what are some of the barriers or challenges that you have faced um, when you have thought about creating open education? Are we able to get that link in the chat? I can grab it too. And you may have to make sure to choose all panelists and attendees in the chat uh, before post pasting it. Oh, Joel, it looks like you may have to repaste it, but just choose all panelists and attendees. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. And um, while we're waiting for those polls to come in, we briefly introduced ourselves, but I uh, just want to tell you a little bit more about what the book we're going to talk about. It's called Write What Matters. And um, I think Joel, you'll also be able to put that link in the chat or Amy, one of you can put that in the chat. And uh, we really started this project with the, we applied to this OPAL fellowship with the Idaho State Board of Education because we were all interested in OER. But I think, speaking for myself at least, we didn't really know what OER was when we started. And we thought that we were gonna come together and write a textbook from scratch. Um, and many of these things that we put on this live poll were things that we were all concerned about, like thinking about, oh my goodness, what in the world will that look like for us? Um, so um, I just wonder if Amy, if you could share a little bit about your experience too, and then Joel, and then I'll pull up that poll so we can see what our audience is feeling about this particular issue. The, um, well, I personally enjoyed the collaborative nature of this. Um, I know each of us had been involved with OER before, but this was just a brand new experience with some new technology, including press books. So it was just really exciting on, on that part. Um, and then Joel. Yeah, so I mean, I, one of my slides kind of covers the challenges that we faced. And so I can just kind of mention some things from there. But basically, we, we qu quickly became overwhelmed when we were searching for open content, especially in first year writing, writing, uh, writing rhetoric, uh, just composition, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you get, the problem is just too much, right? And uh, that was you know, one of our biggest challenges. And then uh, we quickly ran into just a resource problem. We figured out very quickly, like, oh, OER is free for students. <laughs> perhaps it's not free for institutions and faculty. There's a lot of different resources that we um, needed. We found out very quickly that we needed and uh, that was a process we had to get used to. Yeah, thank you both. Okay, I'm getting that pull up now so that we can see the responses. Let me share my screen again. And this will give us a feeling um, really for the room and for kind of what you have all been experiencing as you've thought about OER. Maybe you started where we were, maybe you were a lot more educated. So as we look at some of the barriers or challenges you've faced, it looks like a lot of you chose time. And I think that was certainly one of my major concerns when thinking about um, taking on this project. And I also see a secondary notice about concerns about quality. And I think all of us can speak to that also being a concern. So we're actually gonna kind of talk about both, how to address those, those concerns as well as a few other things that we ran into. And um, Joel is going to present the first part and talk to you about why we chose to 
go with a modular approach. So Joel, I'm going to stop screen sharing and then you can take that, take that over well, from me. Liza, why don't you, uh, you want to keep sh screen sharing, but then just go to the next slide. Sure. Just I can do that for it. you. Just, if you're fine with that, just tell me next slide. Yeah. So here's, here's Joel talking about why modular. Awesome. So next slide. Yeah, there you go. So um, I, I'm just going to quickly go through this because I think we already started to hit this stuff, but yeah, these are the challenges we faced, variety of content of OER textbooks. And I think this is the quality issue, right? So like the material might be really good, the content's great, but it's just just not like well revised or edited. And, and it's also not kind of co cohesive with the rest of the stuff that um, you do like, right? Also websites and blogs. So Mike Caulfield, for example, has fantastic SIFT modules, which he encourages people to kind of tweak and make their own. Um, so when you include that kind of material alongside traditional textbook chapters, it can look a little bit funny if you have a traditional textbook in mind. Um, things we want to include material from readers, style guides, and traditional publishers like Norton will have different volumes dedicated to each of these things, right? So like you have to think a little bit differently when, if you wanna to start to pull in all this material. And then uh, 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 Liza and Amy can speak more to this, but um, when you start to do open work, you'll notice you'll start to run into the issue of permissions. So in a perfect world, everything is CCBY 4.0. Uh, that's not the case. <laughs> and so how do you like bring in material with a variety of permissions? It does matter how you are viewing your, your textbook and whether or not it's traditional or modular. And that's something we can, we can hit on. Um, and then finally, this last is specific to Idaho, but one of the challenges is that students at CWI, a two-year community college in the semi rural area, those students are expected to demonstrate the same outcomes as or practice the same outcomes as students at BSU, which is more urban and is a four year research institution, um, or it's a traditional, I guess we would say university research institution. And so it's a really interesting conundrum and developing a textbook that would be ap applicable to the tier students and BSU students is kind of an interesting challenge. Uh, Amy's at Lewis Clark. And so that was our, our kind of touchstone there. Uh, next, Liza. And so one option is just to curate links, right? I mean, this is a traditional route. It's just like, oh, I like this, I like that. So I'm just gonna get these HTML links and put them in one file and just say, hey, if you wanna teach with open materials, here's what you can do, right? Um, next. And we thought it was important, like we wanna invite this complexity. We, we wanted to have all this different material. We wanted to be okay with the variety um of quality and content just in part because yeah time is a major challenge and we can't create a new textbook from scratch right so uh, and we also wanted to hit all the um oh, if you go back one liza we also wanted to maintain um we also wanted to to be able to uh, hit all those state outcomes right so we quickly discovered that Pressbooks, and, and many of you may have already heard of Pressbooks, is it provides an excellent unified experience that allows you to kind of curate all these different links, but rather than a spreadsheet, you can do something like a modular textbook, right? Where you do have that cohesion. I, I think like we all appreciate the importance of universal design and the impact of design on the learning process. And we found that Pressbooks kind of provided that balance between like, okay, we can get a variety of content in here, let it sit side by side, but then streamline everything according to a single house style. So we do have that cohesive experience for students. We thought that was really important. Um, but it's pluralistic. This is the more emphatically modular aspect in that we do invite multiple voices as you kind of walk through a textbook. Uh, you'll notice it sounds like I, I've authored some original chapters. Amy and Liza have also authored original chapters. We have chapters from different institutions. These all sound very different and we think that's okay. We think it's actually a good thing. I would not want to read an entire textbook just in my voice. That would uh, not be fun. Um, it's also, we treat it as kind of a quasi platform. It's a textbook, it's style guides, it has style guides. It's a reader, it has H5P exercises. It has assignment examples for educators and students. Um, also, that's this is an affordance of press books. It, it, you can become really granular with our textbooks. So you can use a search function to just search for a keyword, like say like Kairos or, um, you know, meal paragraph or something, right? You know, whatever, whatever you're looking for that's related to writing and rhetoric. And you can not only, you can not only link to a part, a chapter, but also a specific section within a chapter. And that's a 
we think that's a really important affordance. And also we invite students and educators to use it in as granular a manner as they, as they want to. They don't have to start with chapter one and continue through chapter 30 or 40, right? I think I'll stop there, Liza. Great, thanks, Joel. And um, that's a good segue into my presentation. So when we all started the project, I noticed a lot of you were concerned with time. And I know that was certainly one of our major concerns as well, because if we think about the traditional method of, of producing a textbook, that's very time consuming, right? And that's certainly what I had in my mind when we came together. And um, so I would say like what we discovered is many hands make light work and that identifying the tools and partners we could use was really important to our success. And the first thing I have to stress here is something I think probably Probably everyone on this um, session probably knows that OER is not free. And when we're really talking about time concerns, we're also talking about this, right? I mean, it, sure, we all have our labor of love projects, but this would be a really large labor of love if there's not some kind of institutional support for this process. And Joel mentioned uh, the multiple sources we brought in. You know, part of the challenge of that then is that we are going to have to continually view the book as a living document where we'll have to check links, we'll have to be constantly updating. And, and we realized that as we chose this model. So you have to think about about who's go, who's how are you going to get paid right like that's maybe the first thing how am I going to get compensated for my labor and we were fortunate the state um, of Idaho was willing to put some compensation toward our work and also toward our training uh, then of course who's going to host your content press books is wonderful and it's lovely but it's not free uh, and so we have to think about the benefits and drawbacks of that I mean you could just use Joel I think you've shown in the, in the past an example of a Google spreadsheet right you could create an OER just using a Google spreadsheet with links but then how is that a different experience from Pressbooks and then Joel briefly touched on how we have to license our work so others can use it mentioning that CCB, CC Creative Commons by 4.0 is really the most um, easily remixed and reused content. Uh, and we of course encountered that we had a, a variety of creative content licenses to work with and that that in some ways limited um, what we were able to include and how we were able to use it. So these are all things you have to consider. Uh, so some of the tools we looked at, we knew as we looked at the platform, we wanted to consider multimedia uses that many of our learners are really proficient with things like HP5 or, or video. They're going to learn a little better from that. It's a little ironic in a writing class, but there it is. Um, we used Google Suite extensively to create and um, curate our project. And we did rely heavily on Creative Commons, both licensed videos, which you can find you know, on YouTube, um, and then also images for our book. Um, we have looked at tools like Adobe Spark and Microsoft Sway that are free and can be um, incorporated. They can be embedded into the text. I guess Zoom is a no-brainer <laughs> when you're creating a project in a pandemic. You uh, need to work on Zoom. But the other advantage, we actually started our Zoom cohort before the pandemic, and we were able to connect with different textbook projects across the country in our um, training cohort with a company called Rebus. So, um, you know, using Zoom, actually, that was maybe the one thing that felt normal to me, that first <laughs> Zoom call that we had, uh, but it is a great tool for collaboration. Uh, we tried to keep accessibility top of mind uh, with accessibility, meaning, you know, uh, learners needs. So for example, a learner in Idaho might not have access to the internet. We created something on Pressbooks because you can print out a PDF. You can choose the chapters that you want to use, print out that PDF and create a book. I've actually had a student do that this term, but then also just a, a variety of learning styles and of course cost whenever we're doing OER. Uh, so we chose to go with Pressbooks, and the State Board of Education provides our hosting for our book. They're an open education member, and I think Jonathan Lashley told me it was $7,500 annually, for that's for unlimited books. So if you're here and not from Idaho, this is a, a great option to ask your um, institution or your, your Board of Education to consider. We like Pressbooks because it's easy to use. It's easy to update. Cloning books from other Pressbook books is really easy. Uh, it's, it's just a, a pretty user-friendly um, format. And again, you can print on demand and if you have digital files, they automatically update. Um, the final thing that I'll talk a little bit more about at the end is I like that students can not only contribute to our textbook that we're presenting today by Creative Commons licensing their work and, and sending it as a student example. I'm actually using this as a project in my English 211 class where students are going, we're going to be creating our own critical edition of some short stories and the students will actually be involved in that creation. Thanks to Ryan Randall for working with me on that. And so now we'll turn it over to Amy.
Yeah, if you could keep those slides up, that'd be great, Liza. I appreciate that. So um, one thing we were very concerned with was just voice and representation. And so we wanted to make sure that um, as much as was possible, um, uh, that we were able to include some d diverse voices. Um, next slide. Those, of course, benefiting teachers and students. And um, we saw that there were some um, benefits of a single voice. There was just some consistency and uniformity um, among the chapters from a student's perspective, they really like that kind of routine. But at the same time, we felt like there were um, more advantages to having multiple voices. Um, we had a variety of sort of philosophical conversations about rhetoric and language and um, SLOs, um, but we were also uh, mainly concerned with just balancing the different stakeholders' concerns. And um, we made sure to actively seek out um, different perspectives. Um, so from uh, Jonathan, um, a writing center director, rhetorician, um, students, and then just seeking out general feedback. And of course, we just modeled kind of the real world process of group work and teamwork. So next. Um, one of the major, um, I think, elements of a writing class that make um, our uh, sort of discipline unique is just uh, the ability to celebrate identity and storytelling. We have multiple chapters in the book that really do uh, sort of encourage that. And I think it's just a very accessible way for students to um, feel uh, included, feel wanted, feel desired, and to, to really kind of instill that confidence and um, you can see some of those chapters there. And next. Um, we also wanted to make sure that um, we were kind of aligning with all of our institutions, have um, institutional objectives and goals that include diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, in fact, our institutions are tied to uh, accreditors who also value these things. And so um, we were able to include uh, resources and readings. Um, they're certainly not comprehensive in any way, but they are entry points into each of these things. And again, that representation was um, uh, incredibly important to us. We wanted to make sure that students had a place to go uh, to to be able to read and to write about certain things. And so those were some uh, different chapters there. And next. Uh, we still want to, um, to to add, I love that that uh, quote by uh, Kevin Gannon there, we should absolutely use the, the power to make uh, the types of decisions that create a welcoming and inclusive environment. And that extends uh, beyond the classroom and into the textbook, which you know is just an extension of the classroom. Um, however, um, there's still some places that we want to add more, uh, more representation. Um, Latin X concerns, I think is a big one. Um, adding perhaps some indigenous and um, uh, Idaho native, um, native Idaho writers, uh, Pacific Northwest, and um, of course, including more student voices as well. And next. All right, I know we're short on time and it's my fault. <laughs> so I'm gonna let you two talk mostly, but we just wanted to end our uh, presentation by talking a little bit about how this has kind of transformed our own pedagogy and how we've actually used the course. Who wants to go first? Joel, you wanna go first and then Amy? And Liza, I would just invite you to go ahead and speak um, all the way to the hour because of uh, what happened. And anyone who would like to take a break is of course more than welcome to do so. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, Joel, I'll let you speak first and then um, then I guess I'll go and then Amy will go in the same way. Uh, yeah. So I think I just linked to three chapters here and these are ones that I use. I'm going to use several chapters to the textbook, but maybe click on one or two lines and I can just, we can just look at these examples. So we did author some original content and this is an example of original content. And this just kind of filled a need that I, I couldn't quite find in an OER textbook that was already out there. This is about reflective writing, which is becoming, I think, bigger and bigger at, at CWI and elsewhere um, as a way to, uh, I guess, become savvier from a rhetorical point of view, but also it helps with transfer. It's really important. And so this part we, we is about writing about writing and becoming a reflective practitioner. I use this in um, actually two of my courses, not just English 101, but also in... Um, American Lit, for example, I have a reflective writing assignment and we look at this and also actually three courses, CWI 101, kind of like a first year seminar where reflective writing is important. And I also, someone from LinkedIn contacted me from Ireland about this part of our textbook for um, 
institution there, it's similar to CTE. It's kind of a, a, a training institution. And they, I think that uh, professor found this chapter in the following um, really helpful for his students, even though it's not a writing course. So we're finding some interesting, like just collaborations because some of this material just isn't quite out there yet. Um, and then just maybe one more, uh, you can click on lines on and then I'll be done. Um, basic integration. So I just want to show like, okay, you know, how do we, how do we reach a variety of students? BSU versus CWI or Lewis Clark versus CWI. And if you scroll down to the end, so this is kind of like, you know, material you might find in a traditional textbook, you might not, but you can see this is very scaffolded students who might need more support when it comes with when it when it comes to writing with sources uh, there's templates there's illustrations but all the way down at the end you'll find these h5p exercises and um i i have so this is self-assessed you can take this as many times as, as you want it utilizes the h5p platform and i also have my students take these quizzes within blackboard to receive credits right so it's a way to really uh just kind of double double up on the on the uh, the reading there and make sure it says, I guess they're getting credit for learning these things. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there, Amy, so you can say some things. Oh, okay. Um, well, just again, we've I've been using it uh, for the first year experience. Um, again, the two uh, kind of freshman writing courses, the composition and research writing. Um, I've also used it for copy editing in my communications class and um, like, uh, you know, Joel said, um, other people have been using it for, uh, you know, employment kind of information, resume, CVs. Um, so there's lots of different applications for, uh, for the textbook and it's kind of a plug and play if you want to use a chapter, great. And if you don't want to use anything, you don't have to, so. And there's also an incentive for students to find errors that we can fix. There's a chapter at the very end where students or anyone can submit feedback um, and we encourage you to use that, thanks. Yeah, I think uh, we all offer extra credit to our students for finding errors and my students have found a few. And I think that's absolutely delightful. Back to the idea of modeling real world experience. I just got to model real world frustration with Zoom for you all. And I think it's important for us to make our students aware that we're not perfect, that we're also lifelong learners. And honestly, that was one of the scary things for me about putting this book out there. I think because I had such a traditional mindset about what a textbook was, uh, I imagined that this thing needed to be perfect before we put it into the world. And so moving away from that mindset has actually transformed my pedagogy, where I feel much more comfortable modeling things to students. And also just in terms of how I teach my class, I want to um, show you really quickly how uh, Joel shared a few chapters. But um, so this book, because of the search feature, let's say I know that I'm like I'm teaching English 102. And so I want to know more about writing for inquiry. I can just put a search term in there and maybe I want some student inquiry examples. And that's, that's exactly what I wanna show my students. So just by typing in the search term, I'm able to find these Creative Commons licensed student examples. And we're hoping our own students will also contribute more um, to these sections by learning to Creative Commons license their own work. So from my perspective, this has really changed. Like, you know, maybe if I wanna, honestly, the meta discourse chapter you looked at, Joel, I, I wanted to teach meta discourse and we didn't have something on it. <laughs> so I went and searched for Creative Commons license things. I remixed and reused it because the, the example that had been used uh, uh, by the original source I used was really outdated. I updated it to Hamilton. And that to me is what is like the real joy of being an instructor. I really owned that lesson and um, I didn't have to create it from scratch. So it wasn't a super time consuming thing. There's a lot of resources out there, but I was able to remix, reuse and make it my own. Um, so I think that we're at 1030 and that's really time, but I'm sure you all have a ton of questions. I don't know if we have time to take questions, Kristen or... You know what? I actually would invite you to take questions because our next, um, our next one of our next speakers, uh, the host of the next panel, hasn't actually joined. So perhaps he's having the same kind of problems, Liza. But maybe it's um, a great idea for have to have you take questions, and sure. we'll try to figure out what's going on. Yeah, no, we would love to take questions if you have them. And um, also here's our contact information, and we would love to, uh, you know, if you want to reach out to us by email or. Um, you know, certainly we'd love your feedback on the book like, and, and how you can use it, but any, anything else, any, uh, anything you would like to know. Uh, so let's, let me check who's checking the chat. Let's check this really quickly. Um, let's see. I think Greg's asking in the, the main chat, how common do you think this text will become across the intro English sections at CWI or other institutions? 
Yeah, that's a really um, good question. And do you want to take that, Amy or Liza? I'll let Amy start. And then oh, well, we, you know, we've been trying to, you know, promote market to our book, so to speak, um, in, in different uh, ways with faculty. Um, but one thing um, I didn't mention as part of my uh, presentation was the, the fact that we really wrote um, a, a number of these chapters with dual credit teachers in mind. And I think that's a big uh, audience, too, that we can still yet tap. Um, you know, we incorporated essay types, for example, the literary analysis that we know that a lot of dual credit teachers might be teaching as part of an English 12 course as well, senior English. And so, um, you know, as, as these kinds of, um, you know, issues come up, we, our, our main thing is, oh, cool, we'll just add it to the book. It's already this, this big, we'll just add another something to it, because why not? And I think also you asked, you know, how common do we think it will become? So it is a matter of marketing the book, just like with any book. However, I would say at CWI, another concern we had, or at least I had, was our adjunct instructors, because I think most of us had been there. And so we wanted to design something that could just kind of be turnkey for adjuncts, since, again, back to those time concerns. Uh, and we do have several adjuncts who've reached out to me and said that they've adopted parts of the book. So it's very accessible. It's obviously affordable, right? Uh, and we do, we do think we'll see more adoption of it. Um, we also, one way to really get people on board is to involve them. So we reached out to our own faculty to ask them to submit Creative Commons licensed assignments. And we had really good response on that. So I think as you bring in stakeholders and um, bring in partners and also make something that's, that's, that's effective and good and easy to use, right? that people will come on board for it. Plus, you know, the thing I love is now when I open my email and there's all these emails from publishers, I'm just like, delete, <laughs> so I'm covered, I'm good. Joel, do you have anything to add? Uh, I think the only thing I'll add is that we, at CWI, our English, um, I guess the Composition Resource Committee, this oversees English 101, 102, providing resources for them, recently revised the curricular outcomes for English 101, submitted those to uh, <clears throat> the Gen Ed Committee. And we used, Liza and I were able to use our experience with this textbook to help inform some of the sub outcomes and how to articulate those things. And it's kind of a feedback loop where um, as we're working through like, hey, how do we update our, our curriculum outcomes to better match the state? And also within the context of, of COVID-19, anti-racism, et cetera, how are we able to provide a textbook experience that reinforces those outcomes instead of trying to make it fit, right? Exactly, we're able to, um, I guess, have more of a perfected feedback loop between a textbook materials lessons, but also the, the state outcomes, but also the institutional outcomes. So I, I found it really productive and fortunate that we have this textbook as we're revising the um, our curricula, cur curricular outcomes, yeah. Well, thanks to all of you. It looks like maybe our next folks are here. <laughs> so yes. We appreciate the extra time so much, Kristen and I, again, I apologize for the delays at the beginning, but we're so excited that we had the chance to share this with all of you. And we really hope that we can stay in touch and or get in touch and uh, uh, maybe you'll be a collaborator with us on the book. <laughs>